Okay, awesome. Before I start, I wanted to share a, a little anecdote from this week with you that is actually very beautiful for this workshop of physical insights for machine learning. So as, as some of you know, there was a workshop organized uh, on quantum machine learning, which is my home field. Um, at the same time, Monday and Tuesday at Luskin residence, and I was invited speaker, and I thought, I got the email, I thought like, hang on, I'm actually in the house at that time. So it was like really cool. So on that workshop on Tuesday, um, there was a talk given by a professor from Princeton. He spent his entire life in quantum control, solving problems of like, you have a control of a physical system and you try to like prepare the system in a certain state. What control parameters or what values do the control parameters have to have? And a big riddle that he is, has been solving in the last like 20 or 30 years is the following. You're, if you have 100 control parameters, the space you search your control parameters is actually really vastly big. But however, the control problem is usually solved. So, and then what they did, they looked at the control landscape, so what we would call optimization energy landscapes. And what they found is, for some absolutely strange reason, those control landscapes have robust minima, they're usually manifolds, um, they're not isolated, um, and there are no traps, so these landscapes are trap-free. And I was sitting in this talk and I thought, have you ever spoken to someone who does machine learning? So, it, being a bit careful, but like, it seems that in quantum control they found exactly the same evidence using completely different techniques and he was relatively oblivious towards like what deep learning even was. So we, we spoke about afterwards. So this is a very nice idea of how these things go together. And yeah. uh, one very interesting thing is this was not, the findings are not actually like uh, um, only for quantum systems or something, although this is his field, he has actually only three very, very abstract assumptions that you can like access every point in your landscapes. It's very, very general assumptions. So it's very interesting to look into that work. So I'll, I'll definitely do it and maybe something comes out of it for workshop in one year. Anyways, so what I want to do, I don't want to sell you a quantum computer. I don't want to claim that this is like something that's, um, well, that will disrupt machine learning like now, but um, my stance or my insights from the last couple of years um, researching how quantum computers could do machine learning has at least shown that there are very interesting mathematical links and that's exactly what I want to show you. So I want to basically, or the message of the entire talk is only a quantum computation is something that resembles very much uh, something like a support vector machine or kernel method and uh, neural networks. So support vector machine in some aspects, for example, how data gets encoded into a representation that lives in a very high dimensional Hilbert space. And a neural network in a sense that we apply kind of linear transformations, we're lacking nonlinearity, so it's a linear, very deep kind of type of neural network and in the sense that we can train quantum computers or quantum computing circuits with uh, stochastic gradient descent very nicely. So that's, that's basically the whole message, so in case you want to check your, your emails from now on. Um, and just uh, because I know that not many of you maybe have heard of this field of um, quantum machine learning before, so just like this more sociological, what, what is this field actually aspect in the motivation? So quantum computing, as a research field was like quite innocent until very recently. So I think uh, 20 or 30 years ago, people were just like crazily experimenting. Then Shaw's algorithm came in 94. All of a sudden, NSA was very interested in quantum computing. There was a lot of money for startups came up, but it was still very, very vague and like theoretical in terms <coughs> of how, how they did it. Um, since a couple of years time, we've got actually hardware and the hardware is very noisy. It doesn't do actually what these big algorithms run on. And it's a very interesting, or very interesting to witness as someone who is in this field because all of a sudden the way science is done is completely different because all of a sudden we've got, we start to actually be able to test things and most quantum computers as you know are on the cloud so you can actually like test algorithms on them, you don't need to have a big lab. But also like all of a sudden empirical and numerical simulations are interesting for people in the field. So far until a couple of years back, people were just interested in like asymptotic complexity. If you didn't have an, uh, an exponential speed up in your algorithm, people wouldn't listen to you. And actually to start rethinking this is, is quite interesting. So in this kind of mm, field, we actually start needing machine learning as an application. We're desperate for an application for these near-term devices. And you see this very much when you look at the lands. This was just from Wikipedia companies that invest in quantum computing. I just put the logos of those. Um, there are some companies that you don't even think have anything to do with quantum computing. And a lot of them are at the moment having at least small teams that are knowledgeable. Very often it's not actually the CEO saying we need quantum computing, but some physicist who like is uh, 
employee in the company and says like, oh, this is what I always wanted to do. So they try to convince their bosses. So there's a lot of like dynamics happening there. Um, and yeah, Xenodo Xen is like one of the, the startups basically that's trying to find, build a quantum computer and find applications for it. Um, and then, so it should now machine learning researchers like even care about this thing and there was like headlines like this and I hope in like half an hour you, you, you can judge this a little bit more and especially the work that led to this headline, which is uh, a gross oversimplification from the science journalist. <laughs> that, uh, even the, the journalist here, she was um, Shelley Fan, so the, the, the title came from her editor and she was very unhappy about that and it was put out like just before they published. So. Okay, cool. Just two or three more, more words about like this, this field of quantum computer, compu uh, quantum machine learning. It's like, so there are obviously various aspects in which quantum computing could improve machine learning and right at the start, maybe 20 years ago, there were a couple of scattered papers that looked more at um, the sample complexity, so could quantum computers learn from fewer data samples? And this was very abstract again, it was more about Boolean function, learning statistical learning theory. Um, and then when, uh, maybe five years ago, this field actually started to blow up, people were, as quantum computing people always are, only interested in speed, so everyone was just like, can we have exponential speed ups in machine learning algorithms? And now slowly, and I'm a very big, um, how do you say, promoter of this viewpoint, we actually stop thinking only about speed, but we think about can quantum computers actually build models or give rise to hypothesis classes that are interesting for learning in whatever aspect. For example, generalization power. So this is why I'm here. I want to know if the models that I'm working with, if there's any theory you can give me that I can push them through to find something out that's a bit more analytical. Um, okay, cool. So. Um, something that I, I started calling like the second wave of quantum machine or it's a bit pre pretentious for a field that's only like four or five years old but so at the beginning everyone just tries to do speed ups they're all like asymptotics calculations the trend at the moment and almost everyone does this at the moment in quantum machine learning is the following um, you interpret your quantum computation and for us quantum computations always look something like the circuit diagram and I hope I explain what that means um, you take your quantum computation and uh, your quantum computation will always be a man manipulation of a quantum system in the lab by control parameters. Um, and quantum control has actually always like optimized these control parameters. And this looks to everyone probably in the room already like a machine learning model. So this new idea, and it, it took actually surprisingly long to, to try this, is um, why don't we use or take a quantum computation as an ansatz of a model like a neural network? And um, so I would like now literally just to spend a couple of slides on, I want you to understand what the mathematics of this looks like. And it's actually not too difficult because it's just a gigantic vector and then you do matrix multiplications with that vector and then you take uh, something like a, a, um, a quadratic form of it. So it's, the math is actually not so difficult behind it, but I hope you get a bit of an intuition what that means. And then <coughs> in the end, it just remains to link this now to neural networks and support vector machines in the ways that are. About. Um, just for those of you who are not physicists, but I think uh, most of you are, quantum theory sounds always like so big, but it was actually uh, just a set of mathematical rules that was discovered by the 1930s or 40s that was all set. So since then, we're just reaping the, the harvest of like whatever people came up with like back in the day. And you can put these um, rules actually on one slide. Obviously, this is not very beautiful. Um, and you will see it has a lot to do with Hilbert space, with like um, operators, lots of things are linear, um, they are unitary transformations. But the good news is, so you don't have to be a physicist to actually understand quantum computing because it's a, a very small subset of that theory that all works with vectors and matrices. The company that I'm working for, they do continuous variable quantum systems and they are a bit different. There you have to have <coughs> infinite dimensional vectors and infinite dimensional linear algebra, which is a bit strange, but it still works. Okay, and I, I always thought if you, if you know, kind of, if you come from like statistics or statistical thinking, you actually just need two steps to go from just a normal probability distribution to quantum physics. And <coughs> I'll try this with you now. I don't know if this, this really works, but uh, yeah. Anyways, um, so disclaimer: we're just looking here at um, finite systems, finite discrete systems, not at continuous variable systems. So if you have just a set of n measurement outcomes. Now the expectation, and you have a probability for each of these measurement outcomes. And this is really what quantum theory is about. It describes the expectation of a measurement, nothing else. Um, then the expectation, you can write it down like this. So it's just a weighted uh, 
so the weighted average of, of what you see. For example, the measurement um, could be an energy of a system, so it could really be numbers of the energy, and then this would be the average energy or like the expected energy, or uh, it could be if it's a particle in boxes, you can number which box it's in or something like that. So this is kind of your description. Now you make things a bit more complicated, but you do exactly the same thing in the end. Do I actually have a laser pointer here? Uh, probably, yeah. Um, so you literally just like write, I mean, obviously before in the slide you could write this as, as a, um, just an inner product, if you write your probability distribution as a vector. And now uh, I define a vector Q that's just the square root of the probabilities. And uh, instead of having like now an inner product of two vectors, I actually put my observe or my observations here on the diagonal of a matrix. And you will agree now that in this formulation, if I just take this, um, how would you even call this, like this quadratic form or something? Yeah. Um, you would actually have exactly the same result, right? So we have just made our ma mathematics a bit more complicated. But obviously because in quantum physics something interesting goes on because our observations can have off-diagonal elements. That's the one difference. And the second difference is that we don't have like um, real positive values here anymore, but we will have complex values. And that's the two steps. And then everything comes from this because the moment you've got like complex values that can be negative, you have effects like interference, so probabilities are something different in quantum theory. That's a very strange way to put it, but, but anyways. And you have non-commutativity, because all of a sudden, if you have diagonal matrices, these commu observables commute. If not, then you don't, right? So that's these two things that you need to add. So this is just like put here. So um, X is actually more precisely replaced by a complex self-adjoint, so Hermitian matrix. Why Hermitian? Because Hermitian matrices have uh, positive eigenvalues, and if we have com uh, real eigenvalues, if we have complex eigenvalues, it's a bit complicated to interpret like measurement results. But So this is the, the reason. So most of the mathematical structure of quantum theory is literally just a helper for things to look physical in the end. It just sounds a bit complicated. And then the eigenvalues of... Um, this so instead of like the diagonal elements, now the eigenvalues of this matrix uh, correspond to the outcomes of measurements. And that's actually almost all, except for one more ingredient, because we are physicists, we are interested in evolutions. Um, if now we had before the probability distribution as a vector, if you have a system that's described by this probability distribution, now you do something to your system, system afterwards is described by a different probability distribution. In classical probability distributions, the, the transformation between the two has to preserve like that the probabilities add up to one. So how would you tr describe this transformation? It would be a stochastic matrix. In quantum theory, I just said that kind of the probabilities are something like the squared of these like complex values. So the transformations are described by unitary matrices. This is literally just by virtue of the fact that we always need the um, absolute square, the sum of the absolute squares to add up to one. Otherwise, these, these uh, coefficients can't be really probabilities, right? So again, unitary transformation sounds a bit like, I don't know, abstract, but, but it's, it's literally just like to preserve probabilities in this formalism. Okay, and now quantum computing is literally just a, um, a very special case out of this where you don't need a lot of the, the overhead to understand it. Our quantum systems are called qubits, as most of you <laughs> will know by now. And um, what are these measurement outcomes if you have qubits, if you have n of those qubits, are literally just like bit strings, so all possible bit strings. So you can think of any quantum computer that works with qubits as a sampler from a distribution over these bit strings. I mean, so it's basically just a probabilistic computer. And um, now the states are these like high dimensional vectors, but now the dimension is exactly two to the n because you have two to the n different observations that you could have. And uh, another thing that's maybe interesting is that your unitary evolution in quantum computing, there was a, a, a big body of work in the 90s that showed that you can chop the, any unitary evolution down to like an elementary gate set, which we call like um, basically unitaries that only have local uh, interactions between qubits. So usually a quantum algorithm, which is this idea of an evolution of a quantum system, is uh, describable by just like applying simple gates. So this is very similar to a normal computer where you have AND and NOT gates and stuff, and you just need like uh, a language that the physics can implement, and then you speak to that language, and then you can actually implement any algorithm. So we're thinking about universal gate sets in the same way. 
uh, and I don't know if you now, like, need to, but, okay, this is a bit like horrible, but um, so everything in the remainder will literally just be, the measurements will always be limited to uh, having an expectation of measuring the state of the first qubit. So basically, we will always ask in a quantum circuit, just to simplify things, what is the probability of the first qubit of being in state 0 or 1? So think of this as like the output of my quantum computation. And it just like looks like, so there's a sigma z operator um, tensored by ones that you would now use as an observable. So this describes our measurement. But literally what this just means is like, this is kind of like a value afterwards, a, a scalar value between minus one and one. And if it's minus one, we know the qubit was in state zero. If it's one, we know it was in state one. Okay, so, so that's kind of quantum computing in, in its base form. Um, yeah, now how can we turn this into variational models? Um, so, and, and maybe to before, before that, because I use this, <coughs> I find it always horrible when scientists, like people in tensor networks do this all the time, they have kind of a picture of their signs and then they introduce their picture and then they think you can think about this picture the way they do, but I'm doing kind of the same thing here, so, so let's try. Um, this is kind of how we describe all these things that we, that we saw before. So this is like kind of my physical system in a base state. This is an evolution of my system, which is the algorithm. So depending on how this U is decomposed into different gates and what it is, I change basically the probability distribution of my system in the end. And then here I say like I measure and I told you just now, maybe just think of only this first qubit being measured. Um, but now thinking about this, like, or just losing a couple of sentences on this, like, beginning state. So just to have a, a general frame, obviously, like, a physical system can have different ground states, but we always want to speak about the same thing. So we always assume that our quantum computation um, starts in the zero, zero, zero state. And what does that mean? So this is depicted here so that every wire here con uh, is one qubit. And then this, like, symbol here means every wire is in the zero state at the beginning. Or maybe, I don't know, would you hate me if I do this as a, as a test question just to check if this is like, uh, what vector would this state represent? So the zero, zero, zero state means you have a 100% probability that all your qubits are measured in state zero. And now, um, so the probability distribution, as I said, is always like represented by a vector. Could you tell me now what vector this would re be represented? The state of like the probability of measuring this state is one and all other probabilities are zero. Large amplitude of the first one. And yeah, exactly. But obviously um, that's not unique because it could also be an I, it could be minus I or whatever. Yeah, it could be a global phase state. Okay, perfect, yeah, then I'm happy. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> okay, then the rest is just actually super easy, so then. Um, um, so, so one thing to know this also like historically, but when you look back, you don't know why people actually never did this before. Only since like something like 2013, 2014, coming from quantum chemistry applications, people have thought about making this computation here actually trainable. So just like have it parameterized. And as I said, this is so natural because every quantum system, is, so basically experimentalists spend up to 20 or 30 years to make their parameters go in some <coughs> regime where they implement a fixed gate. But in a sense, every physical system is like controlled by like tr parameters that we can immediately like associate with trainable parameters. So only since very recently, people have thought about like um, not like having a U and then decomposing it into fixed gates, but actually just making an ansatz that depends on some parameters and then using um, basically a classical optimization routine to find the best parameters here. So how would this work, you would, you would basically like, we would call it like prepare state or execute the algorithm. You would measure the first qubit. Every time you measure, you find a different answer. So you find zero, zero, one, one, zero. So you find like some, some statistics about the state of the first qubit. You would take the average of that. This is the expectation of your operator. So this is a deterministic value that comes out of it. You throw it into a classical optimizer and then you kind of like go round and round to to optimize your quantum computation. Assume you can estimate the gradient. So that's uh, on slide number 152. <laughs> that's coming now, actually. <laughs> actually, quite quick. Um, oh, this is just a picture of uh, showing that there now a lot of research goes into in quantum chemistry, but now also like for quantum machine learning, um, is like how do you now actually construct this ansatz? So it's like this architecture of your quantum circuit. So here, these are like now single qubit gates. All of this together will be this big U and they are then trainable. So, so what do you make trainable? How does this look like? Is, um, maybe for those of you who are a bit like 
well, rounds the in continuous variables. So this is like not qubits, but basically uh, states from 0, 1, 2, 3, so harmonic oscillators that go to infinity. And there's actually an architecture of like interferometers, squeezing, uh, displacements. This is something like optics labs usually have, and then something optics labs don't have but want to have, which is a nonlinear gate in optics. And if you put them together, this thing here actually implements a neural network. Depending on if you choose this nonlinearity in a certain way, actually a conventional neural network, so you wouldn't win anything, but you can actually choose a very quantum inspired nonlinearity, not inspired, but a quantum nonlinearity, and then you get really crazy stuff out of that. So that's a toy model that we sometimes play with. What does crazy mean? Crazy would be, a I don't know if you, if you know, but a Kerr gate, like a Kerr nonlinearity, for example. And there's really, so basically, if you do only up to here, uh, your quantum information looks very nice, like Gaussians, you can simulate everything nicely, then the Kerr kicks it out and makes like, a really funky landscape out of it. So it's probably not useful for anything. <laughs> but, um, but it's ni a nice model where you can tune things away into the quantum regime. And, and yeah? Because where's the input data encoded? Yeah. It's trainable, and you have the gradient you said, so where does it I think you already solved everything. <laughs> Wait. Uh, just um, maybe ask after two slides because, yeah, I think I, I get to that. Because, okay, yeah, here yeah, actually. Um, so, to turn this into a model, you, you need to encode data. So, think about it in the following way, but this might also be outdated because you can mix it in any uh, given idea. The first part of your circuit, the trainable parameters you associate with your features. So, if you've got like these, rota these single qubit rotations or something like that, just put the angle according to your, your MNIST pixel number 162. And um, so, so think of it always as having a state preparation circuit that encodes data. And then if you want to, so you have a model circuit that actually like does something on the data. Uh, and then you always have a measurement. So these quantum machine learning models, or you will call them variational classifiers, but they can also be generators. So variational quantum machine learning models, they would always have these like steps. Uh, currently, I'm, I'm doing a super cool research project with one, um, yeah, with yeah, anyways, with one of the people who is very influential in quantum computing as well. And here we think about that actually once you have encoded your data in the circuit, this is completely ridiculous because you know what's the best measurement in quantum theory. So something like um, once you encode your data into Herbert space, you actually know what's the maximum separating measurement. This is something people have analyzed for 30 years. It's called like Hellstrom measurements and you can link it with like metrics with which you encode your data. And it's like a really like fun part, but it's very likely or I go around preaching that this is actually totally like not important, the circuit anymore. And this is what you just said. Maybe you can even learn how to encode your data. So we're thinking at the moment of like learnable encoding circuits and stuff like that. So. If you're really interested in this topic, there's a really beautiful review here um, of Marcello Benedetti on using quantum circuits as machine learning models. And just quickly, only like to refresh this because this this is uh, this is essential now. When I like going to like this is neural network, this is a support vector machine. Um, this circuit here, if you if you if you enact S, which is just a gigantic unitary matrix, if you want so on this initial state, this is a linear <coughs> transformation, obviously, right? But um, as a mapping from x to the vector that, that is actually my quantum system is in here, this is a nonlinear map. So this is really important. Um, so basically, this kind of circuit maps x into or to a very high dimensional vector in Herbert space. So this is what this circuit does. And then this circuit, if you want to do it, and as I said, lots of people still like think about how to train this now. Um, is then just a linear transformation of this vector. And then this measurement, this looks a bit like strange here, but it's basically just this like uh, quadratic form that we had before with like this strange sigma uh, z operator. What it basically does, it just, um, uh, if you measure the first qubit in particular, otherwise it looks a bit different, but it's the same idea. You take these amplitudes, and um, if the first qubit was in zero, you put a minus before. If not, you don't put a minus before. And this is important because so this is like nonlinear, this is linear, and now here's like a very slight nonlinearity that always comes in that sometimes makes interpreting things a little bit difficult. So this is just when I say like measurement implements a slight nonlinearity on top of things, this is like maybe important. Okay, nice, we're actually very quick. Um, so now you can say these variational models, if you now disrespect now, so, so for me green is always the information encoding, and I, I just have a little toy circuit here, so this doesn't make any sense, the circuit, I'm just like putting it here to have something a bit more small. Um, 
variation, these variation models are in a sense if you discard like state preparation, but you could do state preparation to encode your features into the amplitude vector. So there's a, a quantum circuit, you know, SX, how we called it before, that actually associates amplitudes with features. So you could like think of this as this thing, if you make a certain choice, you can choose a circuit such that your amplitude vector actually represents your features. It's a bit complicated. I don't know if people would like to do it, but but so don't think about this at the moment, but the rest of the circuit, so this like purple thing here, is basically a linear symmetric neural network. Linear hopefully is clear now because every gate is literally just a linear transformation on your amplitude vector. Um, this is kind of a sketch of the dimensionality. So if you encode something, then afterwards every gate stays in the same dimension. You could do some tricks of removing qubits and putting qubits in there to make this like a bit more interesting. But, but in a sense, uh, this will always be your structure. And then measuring something out gives you a scalar. And obviously, like in a sense, like a neural network would like change dimensions in every transformation. And obviously, the difference here is that you do like a linear transformation, and then you do a nonlinear transformation in the same dimension. So there's a bit of a difference. But now the interesting part and, um, is this symmetric thing. And that, that fascinates me in, in, in a sense of generalization. And this is something I've never really had time to think through. But, but I just want to like share this idea with you. Um, these gates, how they look like. Um, a single qubit gate is basically a 4 by 4 matrix. And on all the other qubits, you tensor it with identities, 4 by 4 identities. So overall gates look absolutely symmetric. So they have only four entries, and they're also like mm, usually like related to each other. So you have three like three parameters in every gate. And if you now take this matrix of a single qubit gate of just a very general one, and you write it as a layer of a of a neural network where you would say like the same connections or type of connections here indicate this is the same variable. This is what you get. So you get highly symmetric connections if you interpret like these circuits as new, uh, new networks. So this is now like a circuit of three qubits. Three qubits has two to the three, eight amplitudes. And this transforms the amplitude to the next layer of amplitudes. And here the single qubit gate was on the second qubit. This is what this means. And now you can control these gates. So this is a very like usual way to make a two qubit gate. And the control kind of like symmetrizes things even more or uh, replaces some of the connections by identities. And now why do I think this is actually, so you can now think like this quantum circuit is linear and your network, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, this is not very powerful. It's probably even harder to train and, and stuff like that. But these highly, so you've got a lot of these gates one after the other and they induce a certain regularization conditions. So they're kind of symmetrizing things. So they're very good at picking up sym symmetric things. So my big question is, what would, under these ideas, maybe these neural networks or these circuits be, be interesting to do or good at? And uh, for example, we ran a little like stupid experiment where we had a data set that is uh, a parity data set. So you have bit strings. And then your label is basically just the parity of these bit strings. And you do make a neural network like learn it and generalization error is always like something like, I actually don't know why, but it was always like 0.75 or something. I think there's a good, exp I always thought it should be 0.5 if you learn parity because parity is like kind of, or a Boolean function is something like you learn, I don't know, I find it very hard like to understand how these things learn. However, a quantum circuit could always generalize um, perfectly well. And this is now not uh, anything like, oh, quantum, but the idea is like if a quantum circuit has like a lot of symmetries, it, it learns symmetric functions very easily or understands these structures very easily. So, so maybe something interesting is going on here. So I'm basically just throwing this out here as a mathematical analogy that could be interesting or not. Um, let me jump over this and now answer your question. So this is one of the neater results of quantum machine learning from the last <coughs> year or so, um, which is now we want to train these models. So this is also for me like a link to neural networks because we train them in a, in a way that we train neural networks, with, a, which is with a stochastic gradient descent. And so now the problem is, um, so this is the setup that we thought about this problem. If we have a hybrid computation, so a big, let's say, a neural network that where one layer is, is replaced by a variation of quantum circuit or something. And in the end, there's some cost function. Um, now, if I want to do automatic differentiation through this, my problem is that um, I have to define a gradient of a quantum node of my quantum computation, obviously, to do anything interesting about this. And think of quantum nodes, as I said before, like it just sends some parameters to a circuit and then executes the circuit and sends some deterministic expectation value back. So it's just a, a black box function. 
So now the problem is that the gradient, if you, if you actually calculate this, the gradient of this object here is not anymore a quantum expectation value. So just doing the maths, you get an object that is, has nothing to do with quantum theory. So that was a bit of a problem. But now this very neat result is that for most types of gates, Definitely the ones that we use in standard practice, definitely the one that, for example, Google has natively, they've got like this Xmon uh, gate and stuff like that. You can do something we now start calling a parameter <coughs> shift rule, which means you run the circuit once, you shift your gate parameter by a constant, and then you run it again and you shift it by the constant to the other direction. And the difference between the two give you the analytic gradient. So obviously, Running quantum circuits gives you an estimate of a result. So what you get is an estimate of the analytic gradient. And this is quite sweet because um, this looks exactly like finite differences, right? So you shift a little bit to the left and to the right. and then, But this is not finite difference because S is actually a macroscopic shift. It's like something like pi over 2. So it's, to be more precise, it, it depends on the gate, but it's usually something very macroscopic that's somehow related to pi. So having like this macroscopic finite difference rule is something that has to do with geom geometry of Hilbert spaces that quantum systems live in. But so what does that mean for us? In practice, this is really cool. So uh, just quickly about the papers. So this person was the one taking this result from, I'm talking about quantum control so much today, it's, it's completely you know, unrelated usually to, the, to people from our community, but uh, maybe we should look a bit more into this. Anyways, this result came from quantum control and these people kind of like then popularized it in quantum machine learning. And then in this paper, you find like um, a proof why it works and a generalization and like you know, a lot of, of the theory behind that. So what does that mean now? Obviously what we did, uh, the first thing that we did at Xana do, oh yeah. Isn't that like horribly slow? Like you can train yeah, your totally. method for turning the weights also, but yes. it's completely impractical. Yeah. So one of the big so questions is can we do backpropagation for quantum circuits? And this is right. almost impossible. I think the answer is definitely no in right. general because you can't um, save intermediate results in quantum circuits. So the idea of quantum computing is always that the moment you touch your wave function... You don't have to. Oh, please, okay. <laughs> we have actually, this is a big research project that's going on very soon. So, I mean, yeah. the nice thing about quantum circuits is that it's unitary transforms, yeah. and the inverse of unitary transform is also its transpose. I mean, it's, it's also unit, yeah. right? Yeah. So if you run a unitary circuit backwards, you, you invert it, basically. You so don't you just backpropagate the gradients, you actually invert it. And um, it, it's the same circuit, you just run it backwards in time. But I thought the problem of backpropagate, or the problem that we have here, is that we can't save intermediate results. So for every parameter we want to optimize for, we have to make another computation, right? It's all linear, so you don't need to, you don't need to know where you are, because it's, the gradient doesn't change with... Um, yeah. No, you, you can just run it backwards. But, but so far, for every parameter, you, you, change, you have to change the circuit in another gate. So I don't know if there's a rule that to get something out of the circuit for all parameters at the same time. So I'm not... That would be extremely cool. <laughs> <laughs> and to talk about that, maybe. Okay, cool, yeah, I'm very happy. Um, and also this would be cool for us because what we did from this result immediately, we built a big software framework with which you can uh, train quantum circuits now. So it's called Penny Lane. Um, and Penny Lane is basically like an intersection that takes, for example, TensorFlow or PyTorch. And when PyTorch comes to a point where there's a quantum computation happening, so for example, your computation sends, uh, sends something to the cloud of like IBM quantum computer gets back a result, PyTorch says, okay, I don't know the gradient of that, and Penny Lane defines gradients of quantum circuits through this rule. So, so, there's, so you can I can show you a bit of code, but you can literally train a quantum circuit in, in four or five lines these days. It is Python written, so it's actually not so difficult. Um, okay, cool, that would be extremely cool. Um, yeah, and then there are a couple of games, I won't delve into this, but like there, there's a lot of research now around this. So for example, people have thought like the geometry of Hubble space is actually like, uh, so obviously it depends in gradient descent, like how the geometry of the space is, so it can be very favorable or not. And you can actually do something like quantum natural gradient. So on a quantum circuit, you can, uh, you can actually uh, estimate or, or measure a tensor with which you can shape the geometry to have like a really nice geometry. So this is like in this paper also implemented as an optimizer now in Penny Lane. And this is like a horrible graphic because it's not so very recent. I told you that quantum circuits actually take samples out of something, so you always estimate. And then our question was, is this actually, this is stochastic, right? So is this not also like stochastic gradient descent? And then we could show that actually taking uh, so samples from a quantum circuit, for example, to evaluate gradients, but also for other applications, 
um, we can show that it's the same like unbiased estimator type of situation for which stochastic gradient descent proofs show under certain assumptions that, that things converge. So you can think of quantum machine learning circuit if you now, you, you know, you do a single ba or batch gradient descent, you can actually m have that stochastic and you can have the quantum computation stochastic. So you have double stochasticity in your circuit and it's also quite neat. And it reduces, it's a constant speed up in reducing your resources. Um, okay, and lastly, like lots of people, I'm not super interested in that, but lots of people think about the expressivity of these variation circuits. So what's actually your, your base circuit that you use? And there are a lot of ideas, like for those of you who know quantum computing, there's like this QAA ansatz where you trotterize like Hamiltonians or something, and then there, the tensor network community has a lot of ideas. And um, I don't know, I find it very hard because I don't actually know if we need expressivity, and there we're really lost because so, so what if a circuit ansatz is very expressive? Does that mean it learns well? I don't know. Okay, so this is why I skip over that. Are there any questions? Cool. And then the links to kernel methods is something that I, I really love very much because I was also like quite involved in in looking into this. And also, it's the basically like when I started in this research, I always tried to do these quantum neural networks, so the first type. And then you always have this problem that things are linear. And uh, a lot of papers are just about like non-linearizing these computations, but it's always ugly. You always pay price. So I really found this not very beautiful. Then you go to kernel theory, and just by virtue of embedding things into Hilbert spaces, this is almost the same theory in some regards. And this is really beautiful, and so I'm a big fan of this, this type of thing. Except there is an exponential cost to it. Well, uh, to the kernel. Well, I mean, yeah. the thing is, uh, you know, you, you, you start with a, an input vector of dimension n, right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and you have to go to a Hilbert space of potentially infinite dimension, or but it's very large for it to work. Like, yeah. You can linearize any function. Yeah. Any function, any nonlinear function can be linearized by expanding the dimension to a ridiculous number. Yeah. By basically breaking up the, the state space in all little boxes. Yeah. And then it, you just compute it in your combination of boxes. Yeah. But it's, there's an exponential price to that. So that's but uh, in a sense, quantum computing is doing that all the time, right? Is, yeah. I mean, it's computing in Hilbert spaces. That's true. Yeah. So where's the exponential price there? Because I map into Hilbert space, I compute in Hilbert space. Mm -hmm. And that costs you exponential cost? No, not it at all. It depends on how you do it. Yeah. So, so maybe to, to get everyone else on track. Also, so, so the idea is actually very simple. Um, this vector here lives in Hilbert space, right? And if I've got 100 qubits, this vector grows to 2 to the 100 dimensions. So it's really big Hilbert space. And for our continuous variable systems, they're infinite dimensional, so really big spaces. And quantum, the whole idea of quantum computing is I manipulate n qubits to, to work in 2 to the n dimensional Hilbert spaces. And that's the idea of kernel methods in a sense as well. So the idea is like, is can we kind of like, make like the Hilbert space of quantum system be a reproducing kernel Hilbert space or something like that. To formulate this question is actually not so simple and you can see in the appendix here quite a bit about this, but on a very practical level, this is actually very easy or like very, very, very clear. But, but what about yeah. the readout at the end? Sorry? What about the readout at the end? You had this on your slide, right? Yeah. You said uh, mapping and then something being yeah, right? Yeah. Then there was the readout. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah, um, that's okay. Yeah, I get it now. Okay. This is so cool. You always <laughs> ask the question on the next slide here. Um, um, so, just to bring everyone on board, like if you have an original sp space of data, let's put it like that you can associate or you can understand mathematically, you can understand kernel methods as mapping into an, a big space, a uh, feature space where separations are easy of data. And then the kernel methods never touch the space, but they compute inner products in this space. And the inner product in the feature space defines a similarity measure in your original space. Now the trans, so to go to quantum kernels or to the quantum version of this, you literally just have to change the comma into like a straight line. And maybe if you want to, but you can get around this also like take a square out of some technical reasons. So here's the, the, the easy message. Um, to compute, this is something we call an overlap, so an inner product of two quantum states. To compute this on a quantum computer is absolutely simple. You need uh, just three or two, three gates actually, and gates that normal quantum computers can implement very easily. So with just three, with a constant of three gates, you can compute inner products of um, vectors in quantum Hilbert space. 
So, what is, and this is the first part of the information. The second part is that I told you anyone who actually manipulates a quantum system with some fixed values or constant value, or not even constant, but like with some values that are control parameters, embeds the values of the control parameters in Hilbert space. Uh, by that, I literally just mean if you, if you have a unitary that depends on theta, afterwards you have a vector where the amplitudes depend on theta, right? So by this, I mean, you have a vector in Hilbert space that, in a really large Hilbert space, that depends on your inputs. And if you now associate these with like features, you actually embed features into Hilbert space. So you can't get around it. Any quantum computation is an embedding of classical data. This is like the explosive like part of this. So this here, to produce this vector is super easy. To measure this thing here is also super easy. Um, so this is like a very beautiful analogy that you can start doing kernel methods. And the idea, if you skip a bit ahead, is um, that you could, so this was, this was actually an idea that came out in these two papers. And this is the IBM team, this is our team. And you see they're literally like close to each other in time. And they contain exactly the same idea. I mean, this one made it to nature because they implemented it on a two qubit device. And which is really hard, it sounds like stupid because it's so small, but it's really, really hard to do. But now the idea how you could use this, you have like your kernel method and the kernel method or the machine learning system sends just the inputs to a quantum device and the quantum device gives you kernels back. So a quantum computer is just a kernel machine. Perfect, okay. Actually almost done. Um, um, and just like, okay, here's again the picture, but uh, so, so you, you encode data and then you do this kind of like thing that I call a swap test, uh, which is like the thing that measures overlaps, which means you do exactly the same thing. And now, this is just a, we kind of plotted like just a quantum circuit. So quantum classifier, so, so something that uses the quantum kernels, no, sorry. Uh, so this like quantum circuit with the measurement of the qubit in the end and then a support vector machine to show that kind of the, the decision boundaries look quite similar. You have to be a bit careful with your dimension of your, for example, your polynomial kernel because of this nonlinearity in the end that I talked about. But this seems to be not so off that actually quantum circuits and SVMs in some sense are, are related. Um, okay, and then the rest I won't talk about, but just so so now you say like, okay, this sounds like really cool, but obviously our really big problem is now, we know that quantum devices implement kernels. We know that quantum devices can very likely implement kernels that no classical computer ever has access to. So these kernels can, be, can contain quantum supremacy, but we have no clue what's a good kernel. So like now everyone is like, okay, so, so what? Like, uh, you know, do you know in classical machine learning what's a good kernel? There's very little guidance for us, so yeah. So absence, we learn them now. The absence of answers to this question is the reason why people use neural nets now. Exactly. Yeah. So now we we're trying to learn kernels. Yeah, but that's like neural nets. Yeah. No, it's still a bit different because we try to learn kernels so that they separate data in Hilbert space. Okay, it's for metric learning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there are a couple of advantages, as I said, for example, with measurements, we know quite a lot from quantum theory. So, yeah, as I said, so we have a problem that yeah we wish other people would have solved before us. Okay, I think that's it. I had like a kind of a very specific example of using um, the device that we're building to extract features from graphs. And it turns out like this is a bit of a, this is kind of an idea of feature extraction from a quantum computer. And it turns out that a photonic device with a certain setup actually does a really interesting kernel that subsamples graphs and counts perfect matchings in graphs, but I won't go into this. By the way, all our papers get rejected from Europe's. Um, and now all our colleagues went over to like going through the manuscripts and and taking out the word quantum. And everyone who does that, statistically, <laughs> probability 100%, has been uh, accepted to NURBS. <laughs> and everyone, oh, most of the people who don't, uh, yeah, anyways. Okay, cool. We have no clue how this stuff scales. We have no clue how good these models are. We have almost no clue how to show it because the regimes where data becomes interesting, we can't really numerically simulate. Um, theory is rare to like actually be good enough. You know, if you guys like do perceptron models and then I'll, I'll tell you, okay, let's do something slightly more complicated, a quantum circuit. Yeah, so, so it's really hard to do research in that space, but um, I hope I could convince you that the maths looks interesting at least, yeah. Okay, cool, that's it actually.